As he stood over the gurney with his 12-year-old daughter, Jenna, as she was about to be wheeled into the operating room for a liver transplant, Dr. David Feltz felt completely helpless. Worse, knowing that she would need his loving support and care in recuperation and the demands of living with acute lymphocytic leukemia while he was committed to a dental practice that, he had, that had booked him out for months in advance was even more soul-crushing. There appeared to be no way he'd be there for her. And that is a moment when, things be, when he began to rethink his life. In today's episode, David continues his journey of helping people find financial freedom and create the life they want. We talk about his latest book, Own Your Freedom, Sustainable Wealth for a Volatile World, that teaches you how to create the freedom you can enjoy when you earn passive income through capital investments like real estate. Whether you're a young professional just out of college or a veteran business owner yearning for the next chapter in life, this book shows you how to start today. Welcome to Lifeology. Great to see you, James. It is always my pleasure. It's so funny. Uh, we've talked about this before. I've been on your show. You've been on mine in the past. You and I talk very quickly. And so <laughs> we have to both be mindful because we'll be talking 100 miles an hour. But we're going to have a great talk today. You know, when I, um, when I first met you, you had, I wouldn't say just changed over, but you, you, you've done so many things already. But you, we talked about your book, uh, What's Your Next? And that was one that was really powerful because you didn't want to be in your in the same practices before. Just like my life, I didn't want to be in my same psych, um, psychotherapy practice. And we discovered what our next was. And so there's become an evolution for you. So once you decide, discovered what was your next, now there's been other books as well. And so this iteration of, of who you are, what is different from this book versus previous things you've done in the past? Well, you're right, James, that that there is an evolution, there is an iteration. And I think that's one of the, one of the premises I've, I've incorporated into both books is that mm -hmm. this, this methodology that we go to school and we uh, achieve some career licenses, degrees, whatever it is to allow us to go on into a vocation, uh, that's fine and good, but there should always be the opportunity for each individual, particularly people who have an entrepreneurial mindset to think, yeah. you know, down the road and say, you know, there can be change, but, but how's that really going to happen? And, most of us go to school and we get into a career path for security, right? We want to mm -hmm. make enough money to provide for ourselves and our families. And, and that's, that's, that's important. No, no doubt about it. But the, the fear of change, once we get into kind of a, a stable position, that fear of change or upsetting the apple cart is something I think a lot of people struggle with. And if it weren't for some of the adversities and the turning points in my own life, I'd probably still be there. Again, nothing mm -hmm. bad, nothing judgmental about it. But what I found in my own life and with the people I'm blessed to help, uh, there is a transformation to to like what's next, and so this yes. book uh, on your on your freedom really came out of the the really the middle of COVID uh, last year mm -hmm. in well actually two years ago now 2020 mm -hmm. we've got into a new year already 2020 <laughs> uh, when when a, a lot of people found for maybe the first time that their income stream what gave them that security and stability was shut down. Ah, yeah. yes. You know, uh, the, the virus and the government said, you know, you, unless you're essential, you, you can't go to work and you can't have your employees and the staff couldn't go to work and crazy times. Right. And people thought, my goodness, uh, I thought I was all good here because I did all the work and I have a great business or profession. And all of a sudden, wow, it's not there. I'm a big fan because I learned early in my life that to free up some of free you up from feeling like you have to trade time for dollars. And I love mm -hmm. I love to trade time for dollars when I, when I do it on my terms. But yes. you really have to learn how to own assets, own assets, yes, yes. other assets. And that can be businesses or participations in businesses as a remote owner, an absentee owner. Or the other one I love is real estate. And mm -hmm. owning those assets, if you do it the right way, learn how to do it, it can provide income, more passive income where you don't have to be there to have the income come mm -hmm. in. How did you discover real estate? And that's one thing you really focus on. I mean, there's so many different things you focus on, but I know real estate is one. How did you make that transition when you, you know, when you made the decision to leave your practice years ago? How did you recognize that real estate was what made most sense for you? James, I found real estate before I even became a dentist. I was uh, oh, really? very curious okay. as a yeah, as a very curious as a as a college uh, student getting ready to go to dental school. And I just wanted to figure out, you know, how could I be a better steward of money that I would have someday? Yeah. Didn't have any then. I had debt and I was working as a, a waiter in a restaurant. But I knew I'd have to figure out someday to be um, to be a good investor. I just it was always my head. I was always entrepreneurial in my head, trying to figure out how to make money. And and so I read books. Uh, I was reading books about stock market and mutual funds and index funds. And I read books and books on real estate. And the real estate just made sense to me. It just like, yeah. here's a tangible asset. And I just like, I like something I can, you know, well, the dentist, I, I'll say, I'll sink my teeth into, right? Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I just came out. Uh, but, but, but that's what I liked about the control factor of real estate. 
So I talked my dad into uh, being my co-investor, the financial investor, because I had no money, no credit uh, in the first property that we bought together. That was back 42 years ago, 1980. So that kind of dates me a little bit, doesn't wow. it? So, uh, and from that property that we owned together, I was the manager because it was in my where I lived yeah. and my dad lived a couple states away. So he wasn't, wasn't involved in any management. So I managed it and we split the profits. We split the profits 50-50 which was, was for each of us about $25,000, you know, and, and that took about three and a half years to, to run through that property. And what I realized was that that asset that, yes, I had to put some time in on the front end to find it, mm -hmm. acquire it. And yes, I had to uh, oversee and actually do a little bit of the labor on it to update it, to make it the way we mm -hmm. wanted it. Um, but then that asset produced income without me having to show up every day and, you know, uh, clock in or clock out like I did for when I was waiting tables. And I realized that that asset over time, produced a lot more income and profit than I did waiting tables at a pretty nice high-end restaurant back in the day. I was making some pretty good money. So that was my epiphany. So something about assets that can produce a plan B income stream. And that's what freed me up from my practice when my daughter was in the hospital and I'm struggling mm -hmm. with where do I put my time now? I, yeah. I, I'm a dentist. I've got this practice, this business that depends on me. But I've got a daughter who has been going through some very difficult illnesses, leukemia and epilepsy, and then a liver transplant when she was age 12. And I'm going, okay, how many more chances do yeah. I get? And I fell back on the real estate, which I didn't think I'd be doing that at that early in age, early in life. I thought, you know, I'd probably be in my career practice tell most people do uh, doing the same thing till I'm in my 60s. That's what most people do because yeah. we want to be relevant. We want to be productive. We want to add value. And, and that's the way we learn how to do it. But I found out, you know what? There's other ways to add value. I like the concept of really working smarter, not harder. You know, people people's time is money, you know, of course, but learning how to r change that in the sense of working, quote, less and making more money. I mean, that's the goal for everybody. And so for you, you found with the real estate, that's something that worked incredibly well for you. Now, a lot of people listening here, and we'll jump in your book in just a second. You know, a lot of people listening now say, well, because of COVID, when everything happened, I don't necessarily have the capital right now. Or I don't have the ability to acquire certain things. What would you say to them? Because there's always, there's always an answer. Well, I think it's, it's going to vary from different, different people. There's actually, you know, from the federal stimulus uh, that's come through, uh, uh, trillions of dollars have been pumped back into the economy and the markets. And it's almost like, it, it's almost like, uh, way too much because we have asset bubbles all over the place. It's, it's really the dynamics are not normal. That's, that's, I'll just say that they're not normal. So we are in very different times today. But what I've, what I found is that, is that the most important, uh, capital, James, for me, is relationship capital, who mm. I know. Because, you know, when I started back with my first property, now, of course, my dad, <laughs> I was, I'm yeah. not saying that was easy. I mean, I had to, I had to convince him to trust me with an asset yeah. that he was going to fund. But, but see, I did that a lot going through life. I didn't, I took my little bit of my seed money, my 25000 and I was able to parlay, parlay that. Now, part of it is I had to find, find the opportunities. Well, how did I do that? Well, mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I found people. I found people in the community who were, who were bankers, uh, attorneys, title company people that worked with real estate, um, real estate people, managers, property managers. And by getting to know these people, letting, letting them know what I was looking for, certain kind of property where the, the seller could be flexible with how I could buy the property, that network of people allowed me to acquire properties very unconventionally. I wasn't going to the bank. Mm -hmm. I wasn't putting the tip over 20% down. I didn't have 20% down to buy very many properties. I'd be out very, very quickly because I was young. Yeah. So I think people are the greatest um, ladder up to whatever you want to do in life. Uh, don't let the inability of yourself to, to have conventionally what you think it takes money, which some things take money, but people can, can advance your career path and your freedom much faster than any other uh, point of reference that, that, that I can think of. And I really, I really do like that quite a bit because, you know, when you think about it overall, I mean, there's, I've got to meet wonderful people like you and so many other people that if I hadn't met them, certain doors wouldn't have opened for me. And so I, I think that is some, something very important because in, in psychology, we have what's called law of the group. The law of the group is essentially you become the average of with whomever you associate. So yes. if I'm, let's say a level on a scale of one to 10, 10 is the most fulfilled, one is the least fulfilled. If I come in, let's say at a level eight of positivity and I hang out with someone who's maybe a level four of positivity, all of a sudden that average is going to be six. They level up, I level down. So I think it's incredibly important when you do surround yourself with individuals who perhaps know more than you, have more than you, who, who um, resonate with you in a way that you're like, gosh, I would love to be more like them. 
So I love to hear that you surrounded yourself with individuals. And so even you don't have to be the expert in this. And I like the fact that you don't have to be, uh, you know, a real estate broker. You don't have to be, you know, a real estate whatever. If it's something you want, you just surround yourself with those individuals and let your team help you decide and what it is you can do and how to invest your money. And then from there, that's when everybody continues to level up. And then you take your next group and then you level up and keep going and going and going. It's, it's so important. Uh, w- one part of the book, a uh, chapter, is on the principle of associations. Uh, mm-hmm. So again, to your very point, how you level up is, is putting yourself purposely, intentionally in, in, in groups or environments or with certain people. Uh, you know, you, ha- you, have, you have to do that uh, by, 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 by intention. You, you, you can't sit mm-hmm. back and just be a soloist. And many of us were taught to do that, to carry everything on our shoulders as yes. we you know, climbed our way through through school. And, and there's a part of that that is true. Yes, you do have to be uh, self-reliant to an extent, but you can't keep that you know, John Wayne individualist theory going throughout life because you'll hit a, hit a ceiling every time you can't do it all. And finding the right people is, is an art, much more of an art than a science, right? I, I mean, yes. you just, I found so much, so much relevance in, in, to your point, finding people that were ahead of me, uh, and, and, and living a life and thinking differently. Big part is, is how we think about life. Mm-hmm. We're brought up a certain way to be- have certain beliefs about, well, this is the way it is. This is what you do. And I found very early on, fortunately, because of my curiosity, I found people that were doing things differently. I found the people that were in real estate were different than my colleagues in dentistry. And again, n- no right or wrong here. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in dentistry, it's, it's, it's very, very staid. It's very, you focus on the technical aspect of what you do, which of course that's important, but there mm-hmm. wasn't a bigger picture. And I found that people in real estate were much bigger picture, much bigger visionaries. And that yeah. really uh, fueled into me at an early age when I was open to it. And I could, I, I always, and that way I, I never stopped thinking or questioning uh, what I was doing, other people. I think the art of questioning everything is a good thing to do. Um, and I think, yes. I think people too much of the time get, get into a, to a, to a, a, a run rate where it's just, this is what you do. And, and you don't question it all. Mm-hmm. I think you've got to mm-hmm. question everything. You certainly do. If you enjoyed watching or learning from this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content. If you have a question about any of my content or this specific video, just please leave a comment down below. And as always, stay focused on your freedom. I'll see you next time.